All right. So in this next section, uh, Dewey is basically going to talk about the word experience, analyze the word experience. Um, there's nothing too new here or too difficult. Of course, the writing style is occasionally difficult, but basically comparing two different um, senses of the term experience. So let's dive into it. The points, he writes, the points that have been made may be gathered together by consideration of the current meaning of experience, especially in connection with the intensified ambiguity due to historical changes that is attached to empirical. So experience, empirical, there's a kind of relation between these terms, right? Empirical is about what we actually observe <clears throat> as opposed to what we imagine or think. So ob observing the external world, and of course experience has something to do with that too, one sense of experience. And there is some ambiguity um, over this term empirical because of its history and the history of science and the history of philosophy and how those are tangled up and confused and so on. Um, so experience, he writes, has a favorable or honorific use, as when it is said that a certain conclusion or theory is experientially verified, right? Verified by our experience, if it seems to be true to what we observe. So experience has a favorable or honorific use, as when it is said that a certain experience, a conclusion or theory is experientially verified and is thereby marked off from a wild fancy, a happy guess, and from a merely theoretical construction. So we like a theory that has been verified in experience, I think better than one that is merely theoretical, merely a theoretical construct that we don't know whether it has anything to do with our reality or not. Um, but on the other hand, he writes, on the other hand, because of the influence of psychological epistemology of a subjective private type, experience has been limited to conscious states and processes. So there's this other notion of experience, this other connotation to experience, that it is purely something internal, subjective, right? Different for each person. Um, the contrast of the two meanings is radical. So this contrast between experience as something that can uh, verify a theory that is something empirical, you know, real in the sense of part of the external world, not just part of our um, imagination or beliefs, and experience in the sense of something that is just subjective. There's a radical contrast between these two things. When it is said that certain conclusions are experientially or empirically confirmed, a scientist means anything but that they rest upon mental and personal states of mind, right? When something works out in practice, in experience, that's very different from saying that it's just part of our thought, just a matter of our minds. Again, the word empirical is often set in opposition to the rational, and this opposition adds to the confusion. Right, if you know kind of the history of philosophy, there was you know ra there's rationalist philosophers on the one hand and empiricist philosophers on the other, and they disagree with each other about where knowledge comes from, what knowledge is, and about what the sometimes about what the the nature of the external world is, or if there is an external world, and so on. So empirical comes to be put in opposition to the rational, but then the rational also has all these other connotations of, you know, reason and inference and logic and so on. And so putting these different things in opposition really confuses the issues in a lot of ways, as Dewey will point out. So, yeah, the opposition of the empirical and rational adds to the confusion. The early meaning of empirical 
limited the application of the word to conclusions that rest upon an accumulation of past experiences to exclusion of insight into principles. So that's the early meaning of empirical. So just what is based upon past experience, not into a priori first principles, not about, so that would be rationalism, rationalism, the use of uh, basing knowledge on um, uh, insight into principles rather than upon observation of, ex, uh, observation of the world and accumulation of observations. Thus, a medical practitioner may have skill in recognizing the symptoms of disease and skill in their treatment because of repeated past observations and customary modes of treatment without understanding the etiology of disease and the reasons for the kind of treatment employed. So, you know, there's a way in which you can be a, a competent doctor just from your experience, just based on what you've experienced and observed without necessarily knowing the history of the diseases, why certain diseases happen in a certain way, or what are, what are the particular causes of this or that disease. Um, you don't necessarily need to know all of that in order to be a competent doctor. Well, of course it would, <laughs> it helps. Um, the same thing holds of the skills of many mechanics and artisans. Empirical, in this sense, describes an actual fact and is justly distinguished, uh, justly distinguished from rational activity, meaning by that word conduct grounded in understanding of principles. So there's many professions maybe where you don't necessarily need to understand all the principles that are guiding your behavior or many activities where you can get by not understanding the principles just based on observing what happens what are the and what results happen from what you do <clears throat> but it is evident that when a scientific conclusion is said to be empirically established no such exclusion of rationality or reasoning is intended or involved right that should be straightforward uh, in science when we say that something is empirically or experientially verified that doesn't mean we were not using principles that doesn't mean we were not being rational or using our reasoning um, on the contrary every conclusion scientifically reached as to matters of fact involves reasoning with and from principles usually mathematically expressed exactly so to say then that it is empirically established is to say the opposite of what it what is said when empirical means only observations and habitual response to what is observed. So in science, there is no, in scientific practice, there, practice, there is no hard line between what is empirical and what is rational. To be empirical is to be rational, to use principles. Um, the conversion of a justifiable distinction between empirical as defined in terms of the knowledge and action of artisans and rational as defined in terms of scientific understanding into something absolute which sets every mode of experience in opposition to reason and the rational depends accordingly upon an arbitrary preconception as to what experience and its limits must be so that's a very long sentence but he's saying, don't, um, because of your preconceptions, don't make a hard distinction between the empirical and the rational. Just because you think experience is a certain sort of thing, is a certain sort of subjective thing, maybe, and not, um, and, uh, you know, is not necessarily guided by principles or not based on principles you know just don't make this uh, a hard and fast distinction you know it's an arbitrary uh, an arbitrary kind of distinction to make now there's many contexts in which observation and theory 
is another kind of way of making this distinction. Observation and theory are integrally related to each other, and there's nothing really strange about that. Um, unfortunately, this arbitrary lim limitation still operates, as in many interpretations of the distinction between, say, temporal and eternal objects, perception and conception, and more generally, matter and form. So those are other distinctions that people make a little bit too hard and rigid between temporal ob so temporal objects such as the kind of objects of perception in our world eternal objects maybe like concepts or ideas or eternal uh, platonic forms um, perception and conception is kind of the same just put in a different um, maybe a more uh, mundane vocabulary. And then, of course, matter and form. So, but again, material objects and logical forms or platonic forms, things like that. So when we take these things too seriously, we get into trouble, right? And this, partly by taking this un... Um, unnecessary, unfounded, ungrounded uh, sense of experience. You know, this un, um, inappropriately, I guess is the right word, inappropriately limited sense of experience, of what experience is. Let me check about where I am. I uh, don't want to, okay. So bottom of page 44 is where we are. So Dewey goes on. It may be added that the honorific use of experience when it first appeared, so this honorific use, you know, verification by experience, right? This honorific use of experience when it first appeared was undoubtedly overweighted upon the side of observation, as in the case of Bacon and Locke. These were people who privileged observation more than theory, thinking you can build up theory through observation, right? You have enough observation that gives you, in a sense, the theory. I'm simplifying here, but um, <clears throat> so the idea that experience when people, when uh, people started thinking seriously about science, like Bacon, the concept of experience was overweighted on the side of observation rather than on the rational, on principles. This overweight is readily accounted for as a historic occurrence, for the classic tradition had degenerated into a form in which it was supposed that beliefs about matters of fact could and should be reached by reasoning alone, save as they were established by authority. So that's this rationalistic tradition that you can decide matters of fact by appealing to so-called first principles or authority in other cases. <laughs> um, opposition to this extreme view evoked an equally one-sided notion that mere sense perception could satisfactorily determine beliefs about matters of fact. Yeah, so this emphasis on observation, on sense data, you see this continue up, well, even, I think, really into the, pre into the present, this privileging of, of um, sensation, of perception, of sense data by a particular kind of philosophy. And, of course, you have this in the uh, empiricist tradition, the empir empirical tradition. Um, it led, so opposition to this extreme view, I think this opposition led in Bacon, as later in Mill, to a neglect of the role of mathematics in scientific inquiry, which is how we bring in principles, or one way that people bring in principles is through uh, mathematics. And in Locke, to a pretty sharp division between knowledge of matters of fact and of relations between ideas. So you get in the empirical tradition um, a pretty sharp division, a rigid bifurcation between facts and ideas. 
and a neglect of the role of mathematics. The latter, moreover, rested finally, according to him, upon sheer observation. So relations between ideas for Locke rested finally upon sheer observation, internal or external. So observation of uh, kind of, uh, um, int we might say introspection, right? Observation of the internal world or observation of the external world. Uh, the final outcome was a doctrine that reduced experience to sensations as the constituents of all observation and thought to external associations among these elements, both sensations and associations being supposed to be merely mental or psychical. So this is kind of the classic Lockean doctrine of knowledge, where it's built up out of um, these primitive sensations. And then you have associations among sensations to give you ideas. All right, but we don't need to go into all of that uh, in too much detail here. It's just one example of what happens when you make too much of a, um, a sharp division between the observational and the theoretical, the um, empirical and the rational, and so on. All right, so the problem, the problem, last couple of paragraphs, the problem of the relation between material that is observed and subject matter that is conceived, so observation, conception, right? this division we've been talking about. So the problem of this relation between what is observed and subject matter that is conceived or thought of is a real one, especially in respect to its, its uh, logical equivalence. So there is, uh, of course, an important problem here, an important issue here between what we observe and what we think and how we use thought and how we make sense of and use what is observed but the solution of the problem should not be compromised at the outset by a statement of it in terms of a fixed and absolute distinction between the experiential and the rational. So don't let a fixed distinction between the experiential or empirical and the rational confuse the relation of observation and thought. Such a statement, such a statement of this problem in terms of a fixed and absolute distinction between the experiential and the rational, such a statement implies that there is no logical problem, but a separation absolutely and immediately given. So it kind of get ri gets rid of the problem by saying that there's just these two different realms, you know, one of the mind, one of the world, one of the mental, one of the physical, one of the observed, one of the thought. So you just set up these two different worlds and thereby kind of uh, um, get rid of the problem of their relation or pose that problem in a new and very, very, very difficult to solve way. Uh, justification cannot be given at this stage of the discussion for the belief that in a proper conception of experience, inference, reasoning, and conceptual structures are as experiential as is observation. Let me pause on that sentence. It's important, or on that part of the sentence. So he's not going to justify this right now. Well, you know, the justification will occur throughout the book. Um, but I just want to highlight this sentence where it's kind of giving one of his main theses. So a proper conception, in a proper conception of experience, inference, reasoning, and conceptual structures are as experiential as is observation. Right? So what, what is rational is experiential. What is experiential can be rational. May not always be rational, but nevertheless. Inference, reasoning, and concepts are part of experience. So we're not going to try to justify that right now, but that's an important point. And that the fixed separation between the former and the latter has no warrant beyond an episode in the history of culture. So it's just a, 
it's a, just a historical quirk, kind of. I mean, it's there's interesting historical reasons for it, but it is a kind of historical quirk that we make this um, strict distinction between the rational and the empirical. But just because it was uh, there were historical reasons why we made that uh, hard and fast and rigid distinction does not mean that it's actually a good and well-founded distinction. So upon the basis of the naturalistic position here taken, there is a problem which takes the following form. So this is the this is, is the legitimate problem according to uh, Dewey's position. How does it come about that the development of organic behavior into controlled inquiry brings about the differentiation and cooperation of observational and conceptual ob operations? So we do in practice have a distinction between conceptual, conceptual operations and observation. And you can, I mean, you can think of like at a very advanced stage, you get this um, distinction between, say, theoretical physics and experimental physics, um, which is maybe not quite as uh, as big of a uh, as big of a gulf between them as it might sound like. But nevertheless, you get this kind of um, um, what am, is the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, this labor differentiation between these two kinds of uh, behaviors between observation and manipulating concepts, observe, uh, manipulating the real world and observing what happens and manipulating concepts. You know, there is an important difference. Um, division of labor was the word I was thinking of. There, there is an important division of labor going on here in inquiry. So how does this come about? That's the, you know, the interesting question. The discussion of language and linguistic symbols in the following chapter lays the basis for an answer. So we're, uh, you know, in the next chapter, after we finish up uh, the next section following this, we're going to be treated to a discussion of language and symbols, and that will give um, a, give us a way to think about the answer. But but it must be repeated that adherence to a tradition that was formed before. Modern scientific inquiry, including the biological, had uh, before modern scientific inquiry and the biological inquiry had arisen or been subject subjected to independent analysis, should not be permitted to convert a problem that holds for all schools alike into an alleged ready-made solution. So here he's talking about, again, Bacon, Locke, people like that who came before, you know, they're part of the start of um, modern science. And partly through their work, um, we got modern science. But a lot of their, um, their basic presuppositions were kind of pre-scientific. And we should not let that... Um, kind of solve our problem for us or yeah, make our problem uh, insoluble in some ways. So for such a solution prevents the problem from being seen as a problem, you know, setting up these two realms or saying that it's only the empirical as in Locke that you're building up up everything only out of the empirical, and then there is no problem of the conceptual. So it prevents this problem from being seen as a problem, even though it creates other problems. Uh, finally, while the position here taken implies that logic is empirical, in that its subject matter consists of inquiries, inquiries that are publicly accessible and open to observation, it is not empirical in the sense in which Mill, for example, developed the ideas of Locke and Hume. It is experiential in the same way in which the subject matter and conclusions of any natural science are empirical. 
experiential in the way any natural science is experiential, that is, as distinct from the merely speculative and from the a priori and intuitional. So it's an experiential in that it involves observation, but that doesn't mean it does not also involve theory and the use of concepts and um, mathematical manipulations and things like that. Okay, so that ends this section. We have one more section to finish up this chapter, and I'll continue that next.